Hello. <laughs> All right. Hello, hello, hello. All right, so we'll get started in a moment. Uh, this is kind of that awkward moment when, you know, say you're on a bus and you run into somebody you kind of know and you don't really know what to say. This is those first couple moments. All right, so we're starting to get some faces. Hello, hi everyone. All right. All right, so just a couple more moments and we will get started. Hello, good morning, hi. All right, so this is our Sunday morning yoga talk. And I'm Robert Fulton with Antwerp Yoga, and welcome. So today's talk is going to be the story of modern yoga. But it's going to take a little bit to get there because where we are now today with yoga is actually quite different than how it looked in the beginning. So we're going to sort of turn back the clock a little bit and go back and then work our way up to what is considered sort of modern day yoga. And the reason I thought about this talk is that there's a lot of misconception. There's a lot of um, missing links, let's just say, in the yoga community about what is yoga, where does it come from, and how did we end up with so many different types of yoga? Because when we say yoga, there's a whole range of thoughts that come into people's mind. And part of what we want to do today is just sort of look a little bit further into that question of what is yoga and how did it become what we know today. So we're going to get started here. And I'm going to start off, as you know, I like to quote some things. So I'm going to quote. Uh, Stewie from Family Guy, because at a certain point, Brian loses his intelligence through a brain tumor. So Stewie thinks he's going to get Brian smart, this, the dog. And so he says, he takes him, tricks him into going to a yoga class. And he says, well, lots of smart people do it instead of going to church. And you're going to start talking about being present and grounded. And basically, you're going to be impossible to be around. So that's one of the ideas about yoga is that it's sort of this esoteric grounded presentness and you don't get it unless you do it sort of thing so it's got some positive and it's got some negative connotations and so when we talk about well, what is yoga and if you are involved with yoga sometimes that's very challenging to answer that question and then sometimes you get some very curious looks and then sometimes you get interested looks and then sometimes you just get blank looks. So hopefully after today, you might have a little bit more background to answer that question for yourself and for others who might ask you. So back in ancient Greek times, there was something called the sophists and the sophists were these philosophers that basically charge money and would walk around and just give lectures about things <laughs> and act like they knew stuff. But when they were really questioned, usually by people like Socrates, they didn't really know too much. And they were just very clever about spinning words. And so, not that I'm looking at this as a sophistry, but let's just say, I like to think of today as a little being the Diogenes of yoga. In other words, maybe asking some challenging questions that might <laughs> rub people sometimes the wrong way. Sometimes it might be, wow, I didn't know that about yoga. And then hopefully we'll get to, well, okay, that's interesting. I can accept that. <laughs> so we will have a range of emotions, very ex much expecting that. All right, so again, um, Coming from a teacher training, this is one of the questions we asked at the very beginning. What is yoga? Oh, by the way, just real quickly. So we had a leap year today. Whoops. 366. 
And what is yoga? And again, you have these different answers. And most of the answers are the yoga of today, the yoga of 2020, or the yoga of somewhere in the past 10, 15 years. Because if you ask somebody, what is yoga 2000, 2500 years ago, you would get a very, very different answer. And so we hear this a lot that, well, yoga has been around for thousands of years. Absolutely. The word yoga has been around for thousands of years. The practice of yoga and specifically asana practice, the physical, hasn't been around very long at all. In fact, here's a little clock for us to look at. If we look at a clock in 1 to 12, so if you see around one o'clock, we have the Vedas, between two and five, we have the Upanishads down to Yoga Sutras, Christianity comes around six o'clock, Tantra and Hatha Yoga around seven or eight, the Middle Ages in Europe around nine o'clock, modern yoga around 11, and Asana practice about two minutes to 12. So that's where we are. We're really at two minutes to 12, but there's a whole clock behind us that we're going to look at. So one of the subtitles today could be from Kusha grass. Kusha grass is what you would make the original yoga meditation mat to Instagram. That's where we are today from Kusha grass to Instagram. So let's see how we got there. Going back again. So if we look at our clock, and we see the first thing that shows up is the Vedas. Now, a lot of times people say, well, I got into yoga from the Vedas, which is very curious because there's no yoga in the Vedas. That's fine, but that's going backwards. From the Vedas, we end up with the Upanishads, the Gita, and then ultimately things such as Yoga Sutras. It does trickle down, but to start with the Vedas for yoga is a very curious thing. But we do need to know what the Vedas were before we find out what they became in yoga history or the story of history, story of yoga. <laughs> All right, so the Vedas, the Vedas are hymns for the most part, but they're also spells and incantations. And there are two of these bigger impersonal gods, such as fire, such as the winds, such as the thunder and stuff like that. So very natural, the forces of nature, but they're not a personal and it's always us down here and the Vedic gods and entities up there. There's no connection. The only connection is through sacrifice and sacrifice was done exclusively by the Brahmins or the priests. So in the Vedas, we just have the priestly class and it was very exclusive, the Brahmins. But what we can get from the Vedas that came down through other texts and generations is the concept of the Atma. Atma is the soul. And if you spell it like the big A, that's sort of the oversoul. And then the little Atma might be the individual soul. But the concept of this invisible force that's either within us and around us is called Atma at that time. It's also called Brahma or Brahma. And so we get these concepts in the Veda of this impersonal force, this invisible universal force. Very curious. But what is our connection? At this point, there is no connection. We do sacrifice. The smoke goes up to the sky and these impersonal gods receive the sacrifice and then hopefully we get rain and food and that's originally what it's for rain and food then the next generation is moving towards the Upanishads and the Upanishads we looked at a little bit last time because the Upanishads literally means to come up and sit down that's what the word means to come up and sit down and then have a conversation or a dialogue or questioning about these big questions, such as what is Brahma? The big question though that really comes up is Koaham. Who am I? Koaham. Koaham. Who am I? This comes up in the Upanishads. 
This doesn't come up in the Vedas so much because that's the bigger gods. Now it becomes personal. Go aham. Who am I? Well, one of the answers is so aham, which means I am it. I am that. Okay, what is that? Ko aham, so aham. Who am I? I am that. Well, through the tradition, we find out that so or sa, saha, is Brahma, the Atma, the bigger picture. And the Upanishads start to put this together, that there's this big universal force. The connection here is we've always been connected. And what happened is we lost that connection. So we talked about this before. So if you were with us last time, we talked about the main source of ignorance in the Upanishads and ultimately in yoga, avidya, the ignorance, avidya, is this separation or the illusion of the separation between this mortal coil and the bigger picture. And so the Upanishads start to question those, the bigger picture and like, okay, how do I fit in? Where do I fit in? Why do I fit in? So it starts asking from a human perspective, the big questions. And again, it always come back to Kolaham. Who am I? And so that ultimately we get to what is the avidya? What is the ignorance? The ignorance is the ignorance of the self. We don't know the answer to that. Koaham, who am I? And so we start to get little tributaries or little streams running off from the Vedas through the form of the Upanishads and answering this question in different ways. And so one of the ways is through the Gita, the Bhagavad Gita. And the Bhagavad Gita we looked at last time as well, but just to remind ourselves, the Bhagavad Gita is considered an Upanishad. And it is a conversation between Krishna, Krishna as the embodiment or the avatar of Brahma, of Atma, of the universe. And Arjuna, on the other hand, as our character who is a human. And then the conversation between those two is the core of the Gita. And Krishna instructs Arjuna on yoga, yoga. And he gives him three types. And just to review that again, he gives us karma yoga, which is the yoga of action. Secondly, we have the jnana yoga, which is yoga of knowledge, self-inquiry, meditation, and study. And then we have the final one, bhakti yoga. Now, all of these are going to play into modern yoga, but they're going to come down in different ways. So we have karma, jnana, and bhakti. So the yoga of action, the yoga of knowledge, and the yoga of devotion to what? To Krishna. To Krishna being Atma and Brahma. So then it's koaham, who am I? Soaham, I am that. So in other words, it's the beginning to go, okay, wait a second, I'm not different than these Vedic gods, I'm actually part of them. And this is when we talk about yoga being this connection or yuj, yujati. Yujati means to connect or bind, and we've talked about this before, but to bring together, but it's actually not bringing together, it's realizing, well, there were, we were never disconnected. The yoga has always been there. So in other words, to find yoga is kind of funny because we're not finding it, we're just taking away all the garbage and trash and going, okay, swimming through the muddy waters and then we go, oh, okay, there's yoga, but it's been there all the time. And that yoga is that connection. And we start to talk about that more and more in the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita. But ultimately they're dealing with this word again, these two words, Dukkham and moksha. Now, dukkham is the suffering and moksha is the release or the liberation. And these are key terms in what becomes known as Vedanta. Vedanta means the end of the Veda, the end of the Veda. So it's sort of like if you look at the Vedas as the Old Testament, when Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount comes in, he doesn't say, I'm going to get rid of that. I'm going to complete them. And in other words, Vedanta is completing the Vedas because 
the Vedas were incomplete. They were just all about that, but they weren't about this. And so yoga starts to bring those together with our dialogue between Krishna and Arjuna, between literally the universe and the individual. And so we're starting to move into that personalization. What is also interesting is that Arjuna is a warrior, Kshatriya. Kshatriya is the second varna or class or caste in ancient India. So the Brahmins, the priests, were the ones in charge of the Vedas. But then it starts to move into the Kshatriya, which is interesting because it's a warrior. And it's not a priest. Well, there's another very important non-priest who comes into the picture at the same time that we've talked about as well. Buddha, Shakyamuni. Now, the Buddha was also from the Kshatriya. He was not a Brahmin priest. He was Kshatriya and warrior. And it starts to move away from this religious aspect purely to more of a questioning aspect. And again, it's dealing with these two words, dukkham and moksha, suffering. And how do we release from that suffering? What can we do to get away from that? One track is going to give us Buddhism. The other track is going to give us yoga. But they sort of have to, one has to exist for the other. In other words, yoga really couldn't evolve as it did without Buddhism, and Buddhism couldn't really have evolved as much without yoga, because there's some terms that come together through the Ashtanga that we looked at as well. The Ashtanga comes from the Yoga Sutras. It's the eight-limb path. And we've looked at that. It's yama, niyama, asana, <clears throat> pranayama, pratyahara, dharana, dhyana, and samadhi. Now, okay, there they are. That's our eight limbs. The crossover is dhyana. Dhyana permeates through yoga, Buddhism, and Vedanta. And dhyana is extreme, singular meditation. And so here we are, and so that's on the kusha grass. So in the Bhagavad Gita, there's an instruction of how to do meditation. In the Yoga Sutras, when we're talking about yoga, we are specifically talking about meditation at that point. Now, how did it become all about asana? So again, we're looking at our clock and we have to see, well, there's a lot of things that happen in between. So we have the Vedas and the Upanishads, which we're down to about four or five o'clock into the yoga, sutra, the yoga Sutras. But there's still more to come to get us to 11 o'clock, which is modern yoga. So, from the Upanishads in, just to review, we have concepts of the Atma, which is the universal soul, in relationship to the Atma, which is the individual soul. We have concepts of suffering and release, and then we also have this identification with the universe. And this is really, again, the core of yoga through meditation at this point. All right, so we're taking this in steps. We can't jump ahead here. So from there, from the Yoga Sutras and from the Gita, we get another word that's very important at this point, and it's viveka. And viveka is discernment. And I've been having a conversation about these, the sutras with a Christian friend of mine, very dear friend. And there's a concept in Christianity called diacrisis. Diacrisis is discernment. It's basically viveka. And what is viveka? It is to, with intelligent decisions, dis distinguish between this and that. That's as simple as it is. It's just using the booty, the intellect, or the new, the mind, to make decisions, make crisis. Crisis is a decision. So yoga is about making intelligent decisions. That's what we really get out of the Gita, uh, both out of the Gita and the sutras. How to make intelligent decisions. Well, how do we do that? Well, in Patanjali, he gives us his eightfold about how to follow that path so that we learn more and more and more about ourselves through this process of meditation at the moment. That's really what it is. 
learning the Viveka, learning the discretion, learning how to make intelligent decisions. So that's where we are about six o'clock on our clock. This is where it comes in line with the Akrisis, the New Testament, and Yoga Sutras, around six o'clock. So we're really still halfway around the clock and asana is very small. So I'm just gonna show you something, a little visual aid here. Okay, so these are the sutras, all right? Yoga sutras are not that long. There's only about a 200 of them. So let's say these are all the sutras, okay? This is in Devanagari. Don't worry about trying to read them. And on this page, if you can see, there's two little green circles. I don't know if you can see those up here and down here. That is the word asana. That's it. In the entire Yoga Sutras, it shows up twice. The word asana is very, very insignificant in the Yoga Sutras. Now that's one of those, okay, maybe a ah, or maybe a Rrr. because yoga was really not about asana. What was asana at that point? It was just sitting. In some of the commentary in the Yoga Sutras, they give 11 or so asanas. None of them are arm balances. None of them are fancy ashtavakarasanas. None of them are what we think of asana today. They are all sitting postures. Padmasana is there, lotus. Siddhasana is there which is a meditative seat, but all of the modern uh, asanas that we know about, they're not there. They don't show up for about another thousand years or almost 2000 years. So how did that happen? Okay, then the next part on our clock. So here we are down here at the bottom. There's no asana is just to sit down. Now we get up to here, Hatha and Tantra. Hatha and Tantra, that's around 1000 AD or CE, more or less. Tantra, there's a couple strands there. One is through Shiva, the Shaivites, and there's a very famous text on that, and there's 99 ways to meditate on Shiva. And it's all, again, meditation, but Tantra becomes a very physical as well. There's a very physical aspect to Tantra. Hatha then, the Pradipika, which is the light on the, the Hatha Yoga, is around 1400 more or less CE. That's when we start to get more and more asanas, but again, they're very basic, mostly sitting postures. We start to get a little bit more about pranayama, which is breath regulation, because in the Yoga Sutras, pranayama is really when the breath is no longer natural, but it becomes normal. Now that sounds weird. It's in other words, when you are consciously breathing, but then that becomes deliberate. All right, that's all that pranayama was. It's not until 1500 years later that we really start to learn these different methods of pranayama. And again, that is in Hatha Yoga. But at that point, Hatha Yoga is very broad. There are no styles, there are no schools, it's just a very broad term, Hatha Yoga. Hatha means effort. So it meant a yoga of effort. So now we start to have two very distinct branches. One, a yoga of meditation, and two, a yoga that is physical. Within the Hatha pro um, process, you have the things called Kriyas, Kriyas are physical activities, such as the neti pot, such as cleaning the nose, and pranayama, and certain asanas that are difficult or strong. They, call, they, they take effort. Now, again, we're still not to modern yoga whatsoever, because how long are you supposed to stay in an asana in hatha yoga one minute, two minutes, 30 seconds. 
48 minutes. 48 minutes for Stiram Sukham Asana. Now, Stiram Sukham Asana is in the Yoga Sutras and it means stability or comfort in the asana. Well, for 48 minutes. So, in other words, we're not talking about Ashtavakarasana. We're not talking about difficult standing postures. We're still talking about meditative postures that you can hold comfortably and steadily for 48 minutes. So again, not quite what we think of with modern yoga. So what happens? From around 1500 to about 1850, that is yoga. Yoga becomes Hatha Yoga in one hand, and then on the other hand, it's still meditation. So the meditation never goes away. It just has competition with Hatha Yoga. But then around 1850 or so, what happens? Europeans start studying Sanskrit and Americans. Europeans and Americans start studying Sanskrit. Sanskrit is the language of yoga, the original language of yoga from India. It's an Indo-European language and this hyphen between Indo and European happens basically with the study of yoga and linguistics around 1850 or so. And they start studying Sanskrit and they start going, Ooh, wow, this looks really familiar. And they start realizing that Latin and Greek also come from the same tree. Then they really start getting interested because they start saying, oh, hang on. If the language is similar, then maybe some of the ideas, some of the philosophy, some of the practices, some of the kriyas that the Sanskrit speakers, the Indians, are also related. And so they start looking into the philosophy and guess which two texts pop up? The Bhagavad Gita and the Yoga Sutras. And then they start translating them around that time. And this is where a lot of our translations come from is about 150 years ago. Because the Europeans and Americans start to start looking into Sanskrit, specifically those two texts. Later on, they start going Vedic and the Upanishads, etc. But highlighted are these texts. And what do they start coming up with is like, wow, okay, Viveka, that sounds like Diakrisis. Oh, okay, Shraddha, that's like faith. So Prasada, that's similar to our grace. And so they start making these comparatives. And so comparative religion comes up. Now this is important. This is actually a huge point in the development of modern yoga. Because in 1893, there was a parliament of comparative religions. And this very unknown, very shy, but intelligent Hindu named Vivekananda, which literally means the bliss of Viveka, which is a beautiful name, the bliss of intelligent decision-making, that's his name, <laughs> is invited to Chicago to give a lecture, Chicago in America, 1893. And he starts off, it's a very famous speech, and he starts off with brothers and sisters of America. What? Here is this Indian, very quiet but intellectual Indian guy saying, brothers and sisters of America, at this comparative religious conference. And then people are like, hello. And then he goes on to say that he's Hindu, but he starts to make these connections with Hinduism and Buddhism and saying, well, they could only exist because of each other. But then he goes on to start talking about yoga. And he starts to talk about yoga could also be in this sort of triangle, if you will. So Hinduism, Buddhism, and then Vedanta, which is this history, but somehow yoga fits in here. And this is really the first time that yoga starts to become in the consciousness of the Western world, is 1893, with Vivekananda. But what was Vivekananda talking about? Not asana. He was talking about Raja Yoga. Now, Raja Yoga is the yoga that is directly descended from Patanjali, the eight limbs. 
So he's talking about yoga as meditation, but self-inquiry. But people are like, oh, what, what is this yoga? I want some of that. And then it starts to become part of the consciousness of the West. So Vivekananda gives this lecture at the Comparative Religions, and this is also when yoga gets lumped in with religion, because it's not. It is a way of life, and it is a philosophical system, or it's a manual for life. Now, there are religious elements, but Vivekananda did not call it religion. He brought up yoga at a religious context. And then it's like, oh, yoga is a religion. Not really. Okay, so this is around 1900 then, it's starting to bloom. The language is there, the concept of Raja Yoga. Just a little side note on Raja Yoga. The most famous, if you will, philosopher of Raja Yoga is Shankara. Shankara also wrote something called, this is my translation, yes, shameless self-promotion. And I've translated it as imminent awareness. Aparoksha Anabhuti. Aparoksha Anabhuti means that all of this revelation of I am part of the bigger picture at that moment. It's the moment of that awareness. Shankara actually gave us 15 limbs. All eight of Patanjali's are in there, but he gave us 15 with seven extra. It didn't stick, right? It's like new Coke, didn't stick. And so there is lots of different limbs of yoga and lots of different paths, but Patanjali stuck. And then Vivekananda brought Patanjali to the West. And then in around 1900, then everybody starts, not everybody, yoga starts to be talked about a lot more, both in India and elsewhere. So now we're at 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock is about 1900, more or less. Another very important, three people are on the scene now. So we have Vivekananda, then we have the next one, Krishnamurti. Krishnamurti, around 1900-1930. Krishnamurti was part of what was called the Theosophical Society. And that was bringing, it was trying to find all these connections with the religions. And basically saying at the core, they're all the same. And he was considered this world teacher and this world leader. Now, eventually he renounced that and said, you know what, this is ridiculous. I'm not part of a cult. Don't call me guru. I'm out of here. Literally. He just, out of there. 1929. Went on for another 50 years giving talks and living in California and India back and forth. But the main point is he became very popular with European intellectuals, again, and American intellectuals and people looking for some sort of spirituality. So we have Vivekananda, Krishnamurti, and then Krishnamacharya comes on the scene. Now Krishnamacharya is considered the granddaddy of modern yoga. Who was he? Well, he was somebody who was a Sanskrit scholar, but he was also very much into physical fitness. So he knew all these texts. He knew the Vedanta. He knew the Gita. He knew the Sutras. He knew the Vedas. He was a Sanskrit scholar, loved Sanskrit. That was his first passion. But he was also very into physical fitness. Now this isn't new. This goes back to ancient Greece too. Physical, physical fitness went together with healthy mind, healthy body, right? So Krishnamacharya sort of brings this up and says, wait a second. I want to combine Hatha Yoga, physical yoga, with the metaphysical yoga. Now, how do we do that? He starts to create asanas. Because he was a Sanskrit scholar, guess what? He could come up with new names. And suddenly, we have a whole bunch of new asanas. And they all have Sanskrit names. And it's like, ooh, yes, so it's been around for thousands of years. Well, Sanskrit is a living language. You can create words. And the example I like to give here is dvi means two, chakra, you've heard of the chakra, chakra means a wheel. So dvi chakra, it's not an ancient 5,000 year old word. It can mean a bicycle, a two wheeler. But you can say dvi chakra and it's Sanskrit and it sounds like, ooh, Sanskrit. 
So Krishnamacharya starts to invent a lot of these asanas. Now, some of them were in the Hatha Paridipika. Some of them were mentioned in commentaries of Yoga Sutras. But most of the modern ones are not. So around 1900 to 1930, he's starting to increase the number of asanas. And it becomes a physical practice with the Sanskrit roots. So that's where the birth of modern yoga comes from. So here we are, we have Krishnamacharya. We have Europeans and Americans interested in yoga. It's caught, it's the bugs in their ear. And now we have this guy who's looking pretty good and he can do all these crazy things. He can bend all over the place. He can put his leg behind his head. He can sit in Padmasana for an hour. He can do handstands and headstands and Ashtavakrasanas. And then it starts to be like, ooh, what is this yoga physically? So we had metaphysical, now physical. Then he has three main students. You've probably heard of Valo, Iyengar, BKS Iyengar, Patabi Joyce, and Indra Devi. Now the first two were Indian. Indra Devi was actually from Latvia. And her name is Ujina Peterson, but she changed her name to Indra Devi. So we have Indra Devi, Iyengar, and Patabi Joyce. Those were all three students of Krishnamacharya. So what happens there? Well, as students do with their teachers, they rebel and they don't get along sometimes, or they do. It's a mixture. I have some students watching. We get along, right? <laughs> so students, Plato and Aristotle, if you go into the Vatican, there's a famous painting by Raphael. And so Aristotle's pointing down and Plato's pointing up because they were students and Plato was saying, oh, it's all up there. And Aristotle was saying, no, it's down here on the earth. So students sometimes have different ideas than their teachers. Well, Iyengar, Patabi Joyce, and Indra Devi all started branching out in their own style of yoga. Iyengar, if you've done Iyengar training, that was my first experience of yoga. It's very much about alignment, precision, using um, props, belts, blocks, etc. And you will hold a pose for much longer and you go into little details. So Iyengar brought in his own style of Hatha Yoga. Now, Patabi Joyce is considered the father of Ashtanga Yoga. And so he sets up camp in Mysore. So we have Pune, which is where Iyengar stays. And then Patabi Joyce sets up camp in Mysore and he invents the Ashtanga system, which is a series of postures. Using the word Ashtanga, Ashtanga, the eight limbs of yoga, that's where that comes from. But it's primarily, not exclusively, primarily asana based. Now, both of them did Vinyasa Krama. Vinyasa Krama means stages of series of postures put together. Vinyasa is a series of postures. Krama are stages or steps. Both of them did that. So we have Ayengar Hatha, we have Vinyasa Karama coming up, then we have the Mysore Ashtanga, and then Indra Devi had a dance background. So she brings in the flow element of weaving together these individual postures. Ashtanga is one pose, next pose, next pose, with a Vinyasa in between sometimes. Hatha, Iyengar style is one pose and you focus on that. Indra Devi started to weave these in. So these three students of Krishnamacharya spread out. Where do they go? Indra Devi goes to LA, Los Angeles. That's when it really starts to spread. 1948, she sets up her first yoga studio in Los Angeles, and this is the height of Hollywood. This is when things are really kicking in. So Hollywood discovers yoga through Indra Devi. Indra Devi was the godmother of Baron Baptiste. Baron Baptiste is one of the strong, uh, schools of yoga in LA still. Iyengar, Centered in India, but in 1958, where does he go? Belgium. In 1958 was the World's Fair. 
in Brussels. So if you've been to Brussels, there's a Tomia, which is the molecule, big silver molecule. But it was also World's Fair of Cultures. And Iyengar came for yoga. And at that time, Queen Elizabeth was 85, and she wanted to do a headstand. Iyengar taught the 85-year-old Queen of Belgium to do a headstand, and it was on the front page of the newspapers. Yoga has arrived. It arrived in Hollywood. It has now arrived in Europe, specifically Belgium, at the World's Fair. Patavi Joyce stays with his school, but he becomes the go-to person for Ashtanga training. So these three, at this point, this is around the 60s or so, and this is the birth of modern asana practice. Well, in between there, we have something called World War II. And the Indian Army was using yoga to train. And then they saw other armies, and some of them were from Scandinavia, and they were like, hey, those are some good exercises. Those were integrated into modern asana practice too. So here we are around 1950s, 60s. We have asana has become prominent. We still have meditation. We'll get to there in a minute. Minute. We still have that, but we have this physical practice. From India, now how do these sequences get carried to the West? <laughs> this is one of those moments, okay? The YMCA. Right? The YMCA. There were YMCA's in India in the 50s. And there was yoga being done in those YMCA's, the Young Men's Christians Association. Well, those are based in America. And they were thinking, hey, those are some really good exercises. Those guys are really healthy. That was brought back to America through the YMCA. So you start having this connection again with India to America through Hollywood and then through the YMCA. And what do the YMCA's turn into later in America? Health clubs and gyms. Health clubs and gyms. 1980s, the gym health club, the unitard and leg warmers show up. Jazzercise, aerobics, and yoga start to come into the gym culture. So then they sort of get blended in and well, you do jazzercise with music, you do aerobics with music, let's do yoga to music. So aerobics, jazzercise and yoga in the 1980s and then you start getting the video, the yoga video. Jane Fonda does yoga on a video. The VHS starts to spread yoga like wildfire now. That's the physical aspect. We still haven't forgot about the other side. So we have the physical aspect. What happened to the non-physical, the metaphysical, the Vivekananda? Well, that also comes to us mostly through California. And then through specifically, well, let's step back one more, not through California. Before California, Rishikesh. Rishikesh is now where most people or a lot of people go to train for different styles of yoga. So you have Pune, you have Mysore, and you have Rishikesh. Well, in Rishikesh, you also had sort of the metaphysical yoga. And Maharshi Mahesh Yogi had some very big followers such as the Beatles and Hollywood again. And so you're starting to have rock stars, movie stars talking about the metaphysical. Transcendental meditation comes from this in the 60s and 70s. And so then you start having these ashrams pop up both in India and in California. And an ashram originally means a place of refuge, but an ashram becomes where you go study yoga with an Indian in California and become cultish. 
So then we have the metaphysical coming in through the Beatles, through Rishikesh, and through some of the Hollywood stars. And then we get the hippies. And the hippies are listening to this too. And what is rediscovered is bhakti, bhakti yoga. So we have karma yoga, which is physical action coming down in these asana strings. We have bhakti yoga now, which is filtered in through the hippies, and it becomes the yoga of love. Now, bhakti does not mean love. In fact, there's not really a word for love in the Bhagavad Gita. Bhakti is this devotion, but it is flower power, basically. Because there's a verse in the Gita that says, even offering a flower to Krishna is doing yoga. And so we get flower power. And then you still have the meditation coming through such things as transcendental meditation and the philosophy, Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta is also there. That means non-dualism, Vedanta. All of these are now happening around the 80s. So after the 60s and 70s, we get the Bhakti resurgence. The Gita becomes a very popular text. Um, before we had security provisions in airports, if you walked through an airport, you were going to get a Bhagavad Gita handed to you. You would get a flower and a Bhagavad Gita. Some of you might be a little too young for that one, but it did happen. And so this becomes one of the texts here. And so then yoga is getting thrown around, but it has three radically different meanings by this time. Yoga can mean the asana tradition that came down through the physical, through the Krishnamacharya, Iyengar, Joyce, Indra Devi there. It can mean the bhakti, which came through the Hare Krishnas and through the hippie culture. And then it can mean the meditation, which came through Vedanta. So all of this is called yoga at this point. And so you, you, when you ask somebody, well, what is yoga? This is why you can get all these various answers. Still another level that we have to get to. So we're not quite there, we're almost there. Another level then, it becomes the cult of personality. Now, think about this one for a moment, the cult of personality. Now, what does that mean with yoga? Well, it becomes associated with individual people. So around now the 80s and 90s, we start getting individuals branding, trademarking yoga, such as Bikram. And yeah, look how that turned out. Bikram yoga, or you have Baron Batiste, you have Jiva Mukti, you have Shiva Nanda. You have these styles of yoga that are based on individuals. And so then yoga becomes, well, whose yoga do you follow? Not do you follow yoga, but whose yoga do you follow? So now yoga becomes identified with individuals in this cult of personality. And then you start getting these schools of yoga. And if then you start getting, well, when you start dividing up into schools, it's like in religion or in politics, once you start getting divisions, people start saying, well, mine's the right. This is yoga. This style is yoga. And what you do is not. And so we started getting this holier than thou, okay, what I do, okay, so if you don't do a Surya Namaskar, it's not yoga. There's no Surya Namaskar in the Yoga Sutras, Upanishads, Vedanta, Buddhism, etc. There's no, there aren't. Those show up much later. So there isn't this one specific type of yoga. There's a lot of different ones. And we still haven't even added on to some of the more modern ones, such as Kundalini. Kundalini started in New Mexico, Yogi Bhajan. If you go to New Mexico outside of uh, Española, and I love this, it's Highway 106 East. Should have been Highway 108, right? <laughs> so, Yogi Bhajan, Kundalini, modern yoga. You have Yin starting about 30 years ago or so. Now, all of these are based on sort of this tree of yoga. And Ayengar had this book, very nice book, Tree of Yoga. But in this, he relates the eight limbs of yoga specifically to asana. 
And so they're all coming from sort of these original sources, but they're different branches. And at a certain point, they start giving different fruits. And it's kind of like a hybrid tree that all of a sudden starts giving fruits, you know, an apple, a pear, an orange, a lemon, all on the same tree, an avocado, right? And yet it's all called the yoga tree. Maybe yes and no. Yes, in that if we trace it back, we can find out that all of them did come back to this tree of yoga, which was Vedanta, Gita, Yoga Sutras. Then later they started spreading out. So it's just like the Indo-European languages. There's this considered like the mother language that all the other ones came out of. But modern French, Hindi, English all look very different, but you can trace them back to some roots. The mula, the root. So there are roots of yoga, but at this point we have many different fruits of the yoga coming out. Last sort of chapter in this. Social media. Social media is now where we're at with yoga. Now personally, I much rather prefer doing classes in person. I like to have the, the dialogue, I like to have the exchange. Same with asana practice. I would rather, much rather be teaching an asana practice in person. These are the times though. These are the times. What does that mean? It means parinama. Now, if you want to bring take home one thing today, let's take home this word, parinama. Parinama is evolution or change or development. And it's a crucial concept in yoga, parinama. It literally means to sort of spiral. It's a spiraling evolution. So it's not a straight line. Evolution is not straight, we should know that. Evolution is a spiral, developing is a spiral. That is Parinama. Parinama has been in yoga from the beginning. So if you want to go back and find a seed, for perhaps, it would be Parinama. Because Parinama means everything changes, things evolve, things develop. And that is what has happened in yoga. Yoga has evolved, some people might think devolved, possibly, from, asana, from meditation to asana. Some people see that as upwards, some people see that as backwards. Point is, it doesn't matter how you look at it, there has been change, evolution or devolution. All the while there's been parinama. And this is why it's very hard to pinpoint, okay, let's say this is yoga, this is not. Now, baby goat yoga, okay, we'll just, <laughs> they're cute, okay. But what is yoga, what's not yoga? Well, that's more difficult because from these roots, from these branches, we get these different styles. I guess what I would be asking from this then is then let's stop sort of arguing about, okay, this is the right one, this is the right one, and just realize where they come from. Where it comes from, when we turn back this clock, okay, well, they're all on this clock face. And it's been this evolution. And there are ways to say that each one of these strands, the physical asana practice, the meditation practice or the bhakti practice that all goes back to the Gita that threefold but what we were taught or at least told or we can read or we can listen to in the Gita and the sutras is don't become attached to that don't become attached Vyagra that is the detachment so you can do a style of yoga but maybe don't become so adamant that this is the only style 
maybe we can say, okay, this is the style I prefer, but it's not the only kind. And that there's no one size fits all. Krishna told that to Arjuna. He didn't say, you have to do this. In fact, he gave him the choice and said, ultimately, you choose which style of yoga. Now, he kind of hints that he needs to do the karma yoga because he doesn't you know, quite get it for the jnana yoga. But he says that anybody can do the bhakti yoga. There's something for everybody, but everything is not for everybody. And so that's really what yoga is, is there the, the, the mountain with the different roads of how to get to that peak, right? It gives us those options. So when we start to look at, okay, the different styles, maybe let's sort of step back for a moment before we prejudge, prejudice. Now, people say in yoga there's no judgment. Yes, there is judgment. It's called viveka. We talked about that. There is viveka, but not prejudice walking into a situation already made up the decision and saying, well, that yoga is not right, or that yoga is not right, or that person can't do Ashtavakrasana, so he or she's not a yogi or yogini. Sorry, that's very limited thinking, very narrow-minded. That is not where we're going. It's not about what pose you can or cannot do. In other words, if somebody who's a, an Olympic gymnast who's never done yoga, does that person more of a yoga person than someone who has studied inquiry, self-inquiry? Again, it's not about what you look like. It's about how do we go about it? How do we go about it with this going within? So how did it go from going within to going without and then social media and Instagram and blah, 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 me, 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 look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. No, we don't say look at me. We take a mirror and go, ooh, okay. Koaham. Koaham. Who am I? Instead of looking at the train wreck out there, Tiger King, we say, go ahum, who am I? And that brings us back to yoga. Now, how you use that mirror, many different paths. And ultimately, maybe we get back to that answer, so ahum, so ahum, go ahum. Thank you very much for being here today. We will be here next time, and we're going to be talking about the subtle body, shuksma, and stula. Stula is the physical body. And how do we find that yoga between the subtle, the metaphysical, and the physical? And until then, be safe, be well, and see you again soon. Respect and namaste.